Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama. This is episode 34, My Neighbour Totoro, and this is episode 8 of my animation season that I'm doing at the moment, following on from Arthur Christmas, Akira, Kubo and the Two Strings, The Incredibles, The Lego Movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and the sister episodes to this one, Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away. Uh, this episode and its sister episodes for Spirited Away and Hell's Moving Castle, uh, they're all in celebration of the first anniversary of the first episode of Verbal Diorama. And that came out on the 16th of February 2019. So if you're listening to this on the day of release, which is the 16th of February 2020, then it's Verbal Diorama's birthday. So yay, happy birthday to me or to the podcast. Um, because I'm releasing three episodes at the same time, uh, I'm saying basically the same blurb on all of these episodes, by the way. This episode will be to the point-ish. Um, it will be shorter than other episodes that have preceded it because quite a few of the ones that have come recently have been incredibly long, uh, considering it's just me talking to a microphone. Um, and also they're not going to really contain the usual beginning and end blurbs. Um, and that's really because I want to keep these as brief as possible. And I feel like these episodes are really here as a thank you more to you guys, the listeners. Um, it's not necessary for me to go through all of that for these. Um, I really appreciate you being here and listening. Um, it genuinely doing these episodes and revisiting these movies has just been the best experience and I hope that they come through or whether you listen to just this one episode or whether you listen to the other two as well um my neighbor Totoro I have a special relationship with uh because it was the first ever Studio Ghibli movie that I watched and I didn't realize that I had watched it <laughs> uh, until much later when I, I re-watched it as an adult and I remembered things and then I realized that I did so the story behind it was um, it was I was perhaps about 10 um, and I remember I couldn't sleep and I went downstairs and the, turned the tv on and there was this animated movie on um, and I watched it but I didn't know what I was watching at the time. But I distinctly remember a scene where a young girl is searching for her younger sister. And and that scene really stuck in my mind. Um, and it I didn't realise it was My Neighbour Totoro until years and years later uh, when I watched My Neighbour Totoro as an adult. And I had an immediate flashback to watching the movie as a child. Um, and it's a movie that reminds me a lot of my relationship with my own sister because I was older. So I was the Satsuke and she was the May, and she would follow me around and she copied everything that I did and just worshipped the ground that I walked upon. Um, and she still does. So whenever I watch this, it reminds me of my sister and it reminds me of us growing up together. As I said, I'm going to keep these fairly to the point. Um, so without further ado, we're moving to a new house in the Japanese countryside. We're next to the rice fields and we're finding some soot gremlins in our house. Here's my neighbour Totoro. Rain. Okay. 
Are you off to meet your dad at the bus stop? Yes, he forgot his umbrella. It's okay, May. He'll be here soon. Thank you for watching over May and making us feel so welcome here. Please continue to look Please after us. Please continue to look after us. Last one home's around May. Hey, Synopsis from My Neighbour Totoro. Satsuke and her younger sister May move into an old ramshackle country house with their father and wait for their mother to recover from an illness in a local hospital. As the sisters explore their new home, they encounter and befriend playful spirits in their house and the nearby forest, most notably the massive cuddly creature known as Totoro. So the cast, as I'm doing for all of these episodes, I'm going to be talking about the original Japanese cast and also the cast for the Disney dub version and I'm going to talk about subs and dubs in a little bit. So cast wise as Satsuke Kusakabe we have Noriko Hidaka in the Jap Japanese version and Dakota Fanning in the English dub as Mei Kusakabe, Chika Sakamoto in Japan and Elle Fanning uh, in the Disney dub as the father Tatsuo Kusakabe Shigesato Itoi uh, in Japan and Tim Daly in the English dub. As the mother, Yasuko Kusakabe, we have Sumi Shimamoto in Japan and Lia Salonga in the English dub. As Totoro himself, Hitoshi Tagagi, Hitoshi Tagagi, <laughs> Hitoshi Takagi for uh, the Japanese version and Frank Welker in the English dub. And as Kanta, the young boy that befriends the Kusakabe sisters, Toshiyuki Amagasa and Paul Butcher. And as Granny or Nanny, whichever version you are watching, Tani Kitabayasha and Pat Carroll. And like all of the movies that I'm talking about for these episodes covering the Ghibli movies, it was written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Um, and I'm just going to go a little bit on him specifically bear in mind that if you listen to all of these episodes you'll notice that all of these little bits about Miyazaki are the same that's because I copied and pasted it all so <laughs> uh, so Hayao Miyazaki uh, he's often referred to as the Japanese Disney um, and I kind of feel like that's a little bit incorrect in a way because I feel like you can't compare these the the two men specifically um Walt Disney and and by extension Disney animation um they have made some fantastic movies over the time but they do not compare to the movies that Miyazaki makes because they're they're fluff basically compared to these um Miyazaki likes to put very reoccurring themes in his movies um and Miyazaki and, and, and Ghibli generally, um, they like to tackle and talk about very serious uh, local issues, issues specific to Japan and also issues worldwide as well. Um, Hayao Miyazaki himself was born in 1941. Uh, his interest in animation was sparked by the 1958 movie Panda and the Magic Serpent. And he graduated in 1963 with degrees in political science and economics before starting work at Toei Animation as an animator. 
and he also started writing manga. He worked for APRO, where he started working on Lupin the Third Part One and Nippon Animation before moving to Telecom Animation Film in 1979. His directorial debut was The Castle of Cagliostro, uh, a Lupin the Third film. He then worked on the film adaptation of the manga series Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind where he enlisted musician Joe Hisaishi to compose the score. In 1985, Miyazaki, along with Isao Takahata, Yasuyoshi Tokuma and Toshio Suzuki, co-founded Studio Ghibli, which was named after the Libyan Arabic name for Hot Desert Wind. The first Studio Ghibli feature film was released in 1986, and that was Castle in the Sky or Laputa Castle in the Sky. Um, And I've talked before about animation being all encompassing, that you can do anything with animation. You can literally do any genre in animation. So it irks me. It really irks me when people call animation a genre because it's not. It's also not just for children. And that is something that I'm very passionate about, that animation should never just be reserved for children. And while Ghibli's work is often very different in genre um Miyazaki's movies do tend to follow similar themes and his movies do lean more towards children but especially My Neighbor Totoro um this is very much a movie that is aimed at children but it's also a movie that adults can enjoy as well because of just the feeling of nostalgia it can bring back um for anyone who was ever a child, basically. And that's one reason why I think this movie is so great. Um, As I mentioned, I listed the original Japanese voice actors as well as the Disney dub actors. And there's a really simple reason for this. Um, And it's something that I touched on with Anita and Kira over on the Akira episode. Because as far as I'm concerned, as long as you watch these movies and enjoy them, it doesn't matter to me if you prefer watching them with subtitles or whether you prefer watching them as an English dub. Um, The great thing about these movies is the Disney dubs specifically that that Disney have done are actually really great. Um, I think they put a lot of love into the dubbing. They're not quite perfect. It's never quite the same as a subtitled version. But in my eyes, I'm not going to be precious about it. And if you enjoy watching it in subtitles as it's originally intended, then that is great. And similarly, if you would prefer to watch it with dubbing, I don't care. I genuinely don't. Just go out and enjoy these movies because they really are something spectacular. And they really deserve to be watched and enjoyed. Um, And when you do have great dubs that are available, if that's what you prefer, then by all means go for it. And don't let anyone tell you you shouldn't watch the dubbed version if that's your preference. I say do what you want. Enjoy what you want. Um, I've watched all of these movies that I'm covering. So Spirited Away, My Neighbour Totoro and Howl's Moving Castle. I've watched the English Disney dubs and I've watched them with subtitles. Um, For Howl's Moving Castle specifically, I lean towards the English dub, but that's because I think it's so fantastic. Um, I think for My Neighbour Totoro, um, I'd probably lean more towards the subtitled version, to be honest. But again, it really doesn't matter. Just do what you want. Just please watch these movies and enjoy them. And that is the official verbal diorama line on Subs V Dubs. <laughs> and that will be the official line till the end of time. Um, so let's talk about how they made My Neighbor Totoro. The Japanese name is Tonari no Totoro. Um, and really, it's like, where do I begin with Totoro? Uh, because he is literally the mascot of Studio Ghibli. He's a cultural icon. Um recognized the world over um, as one of the most popular characters in Japanese animation. Um, um, I'm saying he, um, so I'm I'm kind of gendering Totoro, which I probably shouldn't. I'm calling him he, uh, really, he's non-gender specific. um, But for the purposes of this podcast and going forward, I'll, I'll refer to him as he, but I don't quite think I should. But anyway, um, so... Totoro himself has made appearances in other Ghibli movies. He's been in Pompoko, he's been in Kiki's Delivery Service, and he's also been in Whisper of the Heart. He also had a little cameo in Toy Story 3, 
And that came about because John Lasseter is a good friend of Hayao Miyazaki. It was John Lasseter who essentially got these Disney dubs done in the first place and and got Disney involved in the distribution of these movies. Um, And the Toy Story 3 cameo only really came about because John Lasseter wanted to honour Hayao Miyazaki uh, because he's one of the complete legends of Japanese animation, if not the legend of Japanese animation. Um, And... Studio Ghibli was formed to literally blow a new wind through the animation industry. And specifically, Miyazaki wanted to focus on things other than action because anime is generally seen as full of fights and action. Um, He really wanted to slow down these stories and and make more personal stories. Um, And a lot of his stories are based on his own experiences of him as a child or him growing up. Um, He wanted to focus on the ordinary and the mundane um, because nothing is ever really ordinary or mundane. And there's no Ghibli movie that succeeds at the ordinary and the mundane more than Totoro. Um, And I mean that in the best possible way because each character is given room to really develop so we can really understand them. When we talk about the characters, um, Satsuke is a young girl who's growing up with this immense responsibility. She's taking care of her father and her sister while her mother is sick. Um, May is the clone of her big sister. She copies her. She's attached to her. She kind of sees Satsuke as a mother figure. And the father is working hard, so hard to provide for his family. Um, So hard that he often kind of doesn't really keep his eye on May. Um... But he's a great dad. Uh, You see him being with them, interacting with them, playing with them. um, And you can see how much guilt he has about putting so much pressure on Satsuke. Um, And they're all worried for their mother. She's sick with an unknown ailment in hospital. And there's a real worry in this movie that she might die. And how will they cope as a family if she does? This simple story is that May finds a forest spirit by accident uh, who's big, warm, furry and and revels in the small delights. Um, Totoro himself is a child. Uh, he's kind of the imaginary friend that everyone makes up as a kid. Um, little things that I love about Totoro is when they're at the bus stop waiting for their father and they take their father an umbrella because it's raining and they don't want him to get wet and it's such a sweet beautiful thing for these little girls to do um bear in mind this is set in the 50s um i don't think you would ever find girls of their age going to a bus stop and waiting for their father nowadays but totoro is there at the bus stop and satsuke gives him the umbrella uh, because it's raining and he only has a a leaf on his head um and the droplets falling from the tree make a sound on the umbrella um and because that happens more when he moves he makes as many fall as possible by jumping and you can tell how much he loves it because Totoro himself doesn't talk he growls and he makes noise and but it's mainly kind of through his face that the animation through his face tells us everything that we need to know and that the, he just loves this sensation of the water making a sound. Um, and I have to talk a little bit about the cat bus because it's a cat bus. Um, and when May goes missing, trying to deliver corn to her sick mother, Totoro is there to help find her. Um, and it is overall a quite a simple story about this family. Um, and And being so simple a story it actually was quite a struggle to get the film made originally because distributors didn't see a story about two little girls finding a furry forest spirit as being a good investment um not to mention the fact it had this rural 1950s japanese setting when it was released it was eventually packaged with grave of the fireflies and that was because grave of the fireflies was seen as the more marketable property um and while Totoro makes me cry, 
uh, a lot it's happy tears um because it's got this beautiful melancholy about it and it's also just a complete joy for me to watch and it's a total antidote really to grave of the fireflies which remains one of the most harrowing and upsetting and devastating movies that i've ever seen in my life um And this kind of goes back to the point that I keep making, that animation is not a genre because Grave of the Fireflies is a war movie. um, And it's it's something that I think I would really struggle to watch again. Um, Watching it was such a devastating experience. Um, And it's quite interesting that they package the two together because they are complete opposites in every respect. Um, But Grave of the Fireflies, I would definitely recommend you watch Grave of the Fireflies, but take some tissues because it's heartbreaking. It really genuinely is. Um, And even though they packaged these two together for release, um, Totoro was still considered a flop. Um, It wasn't until a year later that they aired it on Japanese TV and the ratings just went through the roof. Um, And that is essentially the, the when the legend was born. One thing I love the most about Totoro more than any other of Miyazaki's works is is its innocence and purity um, and that it not only depicts but respects uh, the the world of a small child. Um, The characters of Satsuke and Mei, I mean, they are children, obviously, but they act like children. Um, They seem completely real. Um, And the English dub actually has this additional level of relatability when you realise that they're voiced by Dakota and Elle Fanning, who are sisters themselves. Um, It's also a quietly autobiographical movie for Miyazaki. He grew up in rural Japan um, and his mother was actually gravely ill for a period of his childhood. Um, So there's more of Miyazaki in there than you might think. Um, the beauty of this movie specifically is in its quiet innocence and simplicity um, because it's not a traditional story. Um, There's no three-act structure. There's no villains. There's no heroes. There's no climactic scenes. And there's actually no real conflict at all. Um, It's steeped in these traditional Japanese values as well as full of this mysticism um, and whimsy um, and yet it's it's also dripping in hard truths um, of struggling as a single parent and having a loved one sick in hospital. Um, it makes you feel sort of quietly melancholy as well as bringing a massive smile to your face. It's kind of completely normal and completely abnormal at the same time. Um, and the thing that really gets me about this movie is when we're talking about the forest and the spirits within the forest, the time stands still for them because they are thousands of years old. Um, But when we're talking about children like May and Satsuke, time flies for children uh, because children aren't children for very long. You know, they become teenagers who become adults. And Totoro kind of languishes in this precious innocence of a happy childhood because, as we all know, childhood is finite um it inspires us to feel that sense of nostalgia as adults watching this movie um in the way we played with our siblings or friends or cousins as children when we made up these stories uh or we pretended things about big furry creatures who are helping us you know um totoro himself exists as a metaphor to explain nature through the eyes of a child it's Totoro who makes the wind blow with his breath. And sometimes it's also the cat bus kind of driving by, but adults will never see it. It's only children that will see it. Um, it's Totoro that makes the big raindrops fall from the trees. And it's Totoro that helps the plants grow. Um, Totoro shows May and Satsuke the wonder of the forest and the natural world, which is something that we should all be teaching children even if it is just with the magic of Totoro, that this is what Totoro is doing for us. He's helping us. He's helping the plants and he's helping the animals. And it's just such a wonderful experience to go through. Um, Like all of Miyazaki's work, it's ridiculously beautifully animated. 
um, with gorgeous landscapes um, overlooking the Satoyama. And Satoyama is essentially a valley in between the hills. Um, it's a very traditional village that's depicted, nestled in the foothills of mountains with rice paddy fields stretched out as far as a child's eye can see. Um, and in this movie, even things like the wind and rain is given character. Um, and I think that's what's so great about my neighbour Totoro is Totoro feels real, but he's also fantastical. And it's these contrasting comparisons that make Totoro stand out within this Studio Ghibli genuine brilliance that this this studio kind of puts out and the technical achievement that they always achieve um, because nothing, nothing that Studio Ghibli have or ever will do will compare to My Neighbour Totoro in its pure simplistic brilliance. There are obviously similarities in the story of Totoro with the likes of Alice in Wonderland but with this movie particularly, um, I prefer it to Alice in Wonderland um, just because it's got this rich history of Japanese culture, um, legacy and these very quiet references to Shinto Buddhism, uh, which is something that I also speak a little bit about in Spirited Away. Um, and Shinto is essentially teaching that spirits exist in all things and that you pay respects to them. And those little things just make it feel just so more rich than the Disney adaptation of the Lewis Carroll Alice in Wonderland book. For me, um, interestingly, this movie also came out the same year as Akira did. Just a complete variation. If you ever wanted just a complete variation in style, tone, violence, story. I mean, literally the opposite in every respect. But as much as I love Akira for everything that it does so fantastically, I think that My Neighbour Totoro is just takes you back to being a child. And that's the most wonderful feeling, I think, that you could have watching a movie. Um, the music as well um, by Miyazaki's friend and longtime collaborator Joe Hisaishi. Um, I mentioned over in the Howl's Moving Castle episode that I adore that score so much um but i think that he's such a talented musician that the music is just it really encapsulates this beautiful pureness and nostalgia and innocence um at this point of any podcast episode most of my podcast episodes not all of them but most of them i do something called the obligatory keanu reference and with the best will in the world trying to link Keanu Reeves to anything that Studio Ghibli have ever done is pretty much impossible. So I changed it. For these episodes, I'm doing, if Keanu was in the live action adaptation of this movie, who would he play? Um, and for this movie, I think he'd be brilliant as Tatsuo Kusakabe. And that's Satsuke and May's dad. Um, the alternative, I think, would be if he donned motion capture and played Totoro, because I also think he'd be a very, very good Totoro as well. As with all of these episodes that I'm doing, I'm really struggling a lot with the fact that I'm trying to keep the episodes very brief, because with any of Miyazaki's work, it's there's so much to talk about. I feel like with a movie like My Neighbour Totoro, it's so rich and, and gorgeous and I actually had a DM from someone, I will keep them nameless, um, who had seen the movie recently and said that they didn't really get it and they didn't really understand what the point of the movie was. I replied and I was like, do you know what? I completely understand that because if you go into this expecting a traditional movie with a three-act structure and with a villain and a hero and some conflict, you'll kind of walk out of it and go, well, what did I just watch? Like it if you look at it like that, it doesn't make sense. But if you clear your mind of all of your expectations of what a movie or a feature film or whatever you want to call it should be, any story, in fact, and you just kind of go back to remembering what it was like being a child and looking at a world the way a child would look at it and not taking things for granted, because I think that's the most important lesson out of My Neighbour Totoro is... Don't take things for granted because although Totoro is helping the flowers grow and creating the wind and the rain and, and all of those things that we, we, they're all things that we take for granted. It's just, it's just about the pure 
joy and nostalgia of being a kid. Um, so maybe try rewatching it that way. Um, and hopefully you'll see it. But do you know what? If you don't see it, then you don't see it. Um, it's my view on it is that sometimes you understand the point of a movie and sometimes you don't. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. But for me, this just really, it tugs at my heartstrings in the most beautiful way. I come out of this movie and I just smile from ear to ear. A lot like Totoro, actually. Um, I just think it's wonderful. Anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on my neighbour Totoro. Um, for the next episode, I'm finishing this animation season. Obviously, I'm doing these three episodes together. And then the next episode will be the final episode of the animation season. And I, there were so many wonderful animated movies that I wanted to cover that just didn't kind of make the cut, so to speak. But I felt I had to end on Disney uh, because... Disney is undoubtedly the biggest animation studio in the world. Um, I could have gone for something like The Lion King or Beauty and the Beast. Um, I similarly could have gone for the first full-length animated feature, um, which is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, but, you know, I'm a bit weird. So <laughs> um, I wanted to basically emulate Titan AE in the sense that the first episode that I ever did for this podcast was Titan AE. I'd never seen the movie before and I watched it specifically for this podcast. And so I'm doing it again, basically. Uh, there's quite a lot of Disney movies that I haven't seen. Uh, and one of them is Treasure Planet. And so for the first episode of the second year of Verbal Diorama and the final episode of the animation season, I'm going to be looking at Treasure Planet. Um, and... Like I said, I'm not going to end with all of the usual blurb that I do, but I just really wanted to say to you, the listener who's listening to this, um, whether this is the first episode you've ever listened to or the 10th or the 20th or even the 34th, let's say, um, just a massive thank you to you for coming on this journey with me. And thank you also to my Patreon supporters, to Simon, Sade, Hardiel, Claudia, Simon, Laurel and Derek. Um, you are all fantastic. And I look forward to seeing or well, actually, no, not seeing to talking to you uh, for the next episode for Treasure Planet. No end blurb, just heartfelt thanks and happy birthday, Verbal Diorama. Bye. <laughs>